Color, it's everywhere. We see it every day and it affects every aspect of our lives. What we wear, how we feel, how fast we move, how much we eat, and how we decorate our homes. Try to imagine your life without color. How boring it would be. Barb Watson, nationally known seminar instructor, teaches color theory using the KISS method. Keep it simple. No matter what your medium, oil, acrylic, watercolor, or fabric, the basics of color theory remain the same. Relax and enjoy the process of learning the ABCs of color with Barb Watson. Hi, I'm Barb Watson and I love teaching color theory. I think it's something very important for all artists to learn no matter what type of medium they're using. I always try to keep the subject as simple as possible even though it is relatively complex. We're going to take everything one step at a time. So let's talk first about the three properties of a color. Those three properties are hue, that refers to what color we call it, value, that refers to how light or how dark a color is, and intensity. Intensity refers to how bright or vivid, how dull or gray a color might be. We're going to discuss each one of these things a little bit at a time and you need to take the time to learn them. Let's go first with what hue it is. We're talking here about the colors, the color name. For example, if you look at the teapot and the orange, those are bright, vivid colors. We can say the teapot is blue, the orange is orange. Anytime that we talk about colors, we need to be very specific. When we're talking about the hue, that is simply the color name that we give it. For example, you know what yellow is when you think of yellow. When I think of yellow, it might be something a little bit different. I oftentimes want you to refer to the same thing that I am thinking about. For that purpose, I have what I call a baseline chart. Now the baseline chart is nothing but colors that are at full intensity. We'll talk a little bit more about the baseline chart in a few minutes. Intensity is another property of color. Intensity refers again to how bright and how vivid the color is. If we look again at the teapot, the intensity of the blue is very, very bright. However, if we look at the quilt, the blue colors that are shown there are very low in intensity in relationship to the blue of the pot. We always are talking about relationships whenever we talk about color. Value refers to how light or how dark something appears to be. Value is simply that. It's a relationship that we can judge based upon a gray scale from black to white. If I look at the quilt, I can see both light and dark values. We have a very light value blue and a very dark value blue. Again, let's go through these three separate properties. Hue, what color is it? Now if you think about it, you're probably going to say there's at least a thousand different colors in the world. There really aren't. And we can divide colors down into simple categories. Those simple categories are the primary colors, the secondary colors, and tertiary colors. Let's take each one of those categories separately and get out a color wheel and learn to tell where they are on that color wheel. The primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. Red, yellow, and blue are the three colors that I call the number one colors. Number one colors because they're the ones that we can make all other colors from. Red, yellow, and blue. Why don't you take the time to mark those as number one colors on your color wheel? It's just a good reminder. I can refer to this chart 
and show you again. The primary colors are red, yellow, and blue, and I call them my number one colors. Now any time that you add one plus one, you've just got to come up with two. And that's what the secondary colors are. Any time I mix a primary color with another primary color, I come up with a secondary color or a number two color. So if I mix red plus yellow, I get orange. If I mix yellow plus blue, I get green. If I mix blue plus red, I get violet. One plus one is two. One plus one is two. Why don't you take a minute and mark the number two colors on your color wheel? The last category of colors are called tertiary colors. Now personally, I hate saying that word. Tertiary is one that I kind of get my tongue wrapped around my teeth once in a while. Tertiary colors are a group of colors that are made by mixing a number one color with an adjacent number two color. Let's look at the color wheel first. If I mix red, which is a primary, a number one color, with an adjacent secondary color of orange, red plus orange, one plus two, has got to give me a number three. So needless to say, I call these my number three colors rather than trying to remember that word tertiary. If you look at this chart, again, let's go over the very basics. We have our primary colors, our number one colors, red, yellow, and blue. If I mix one plus one, I'm going to come up with two, my secondary colors. And again, if you mix one plus two, you've got to come up with a number three color, your tertiary colors. If you will look at your color wheel and go through the process of identifying all six of your tertiary colors, mark them with a number three. The next thing that I want you to start thinking about is learning how to identify color families accurately. I say accurately because it's really important. Anytime you're working within a color scheme, the colors need to appear to be within that color scheme. If you can't tell what a color actually is, then you might run into problems and you oftentimes will get outside of your color scheme. Let's talk about the different color families and how you can go about identifying colors because again it's important. What I'd like for you to do is to gather up a whole group of objects from around your house or better yet go down to the paint store. You know your local neighborhood paint store and walk in there like you own a 20 room mansion and gather up a whole handful of paint sample chips. Now what are you going to do with them? You're going to learn how to identify color. And to do that, you have to have something that you can refer to. How do you know if red is red or yellow is yellow? Again, let's go back to the baseline chart. These are the colors that I think of as pure, bright, vivid color, appropriate for every color family that we have come up with. By the way, did you notice there were only 12 of them? Only 12 color families. Now, every single color in the whole world can be put into one of those 12 color families. Even the so-called neutral colors. You know, neutral colors, those are always the ones that give you problems. You've probably gone out sometime and you have wanted to pick up the perfect blouse that would match that pair of slacks that you bought a week ago. Let's say they're khaki color. That's one of my favorites. Khaki. What color is khaki? Well, you'll find out when you pick up a blouse that you are trying to match to a pair of pants that oftentimes you'll miss. You don't have the two colors that you can judge one against the other. And you find that they really and truly do not match. That's because you don't have anything that you're judging color against. Right? Let's take and identify colors. It's really, really important that you learn to do this. Come in close counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, and that's just about it. Take the paint sample chart that you have 
and do something like this. Try to identify what color family it is. Take a paint sample chart and with a pen, mark on it. Well, I think this is yellow, or I think this is orange, or I think this is green. Write it down. While you're doing that, the camera's going to be frozen on the baseline chart for a few minutes. Pause your video and take the time to do this exercise because it really, really is important. Okay, that wasn't maybe as easy as you thought it would be. And you're going, well, Barb, I'm not real sure how I can tell if I'm accurate. There's got to be a way. There is, and it's really pretty simple. I'll take the paint sample chart that I have, and I'll tell you how I train my eye to see the color. Let's look at this particular chip. I think it's an orange. I think it's an orange, but thinking and knowing are two different things. How do I tell? I place the paint sample chip in a color family that has some red in it, and then I gradually start moving it closer to the color family that I think it belongs in. Now that's getting better right there, isn't it? But when I get it right here, you can see that the color settles down. If I go any further, you can see that there's too much red in relationship to yellow-orange. Remember that word relationship really, really is important. Again, let's try another color. I'll take this one. I think it's blue, and I'm probably right, but it never hurts to check. If I lay it on top of yellow-green, I can see that this is much bluer than the yellow-green is. Here it's starting to look a little bit better. As I scoot down the line of the baseline colors, it starts to appear better. It rests easier. When I line it up over the blue, you can see that the blues relate very well. Over here, on the blue-violet, it does not settle down. This is one way to do it. Another way and another exercise for you is to take a look at the uh, color family chart that I have here. What I have is the basic baseline colors right in the center. <coughs> Excuse me. I also have taken and used other acrylic paints that I'm familiar with and I've placed them in a color family. You can see that all of these are blue. Some of them are lighter, some of them are darker, but they're still blue, as these are all oranges, violets, and yellows. Take the time to learn to identify color as accurately as you possibly can. Right now, all we've talked about is the color, the hue. That's one of the three properties. Let's go on and talk a little bit about intensity. Intensity of color is something that demands the viewer's attention. We need to talk about terminology, things that you say to yourself as you're working. It's bright, or it's dull, or it's gray, or it's toned down, or it's muted. Do you hear the vocabulary that I'm using? It all refers to how bright and vivid a color might happen to be. Now, my favorite term for colors that are too bright, especially when a student uses them, is honking. Demands attention, just like that horn does. Now, if it's not too bright, it might just be a little toot. Um, intense color draws the viewer's eye. If you look at the box that has the painting of the paint tube on it, you'll notice that your eye is drawn first to the high intensity color that I used in that paint tube. If we look at the matted print, you can see that the intense color that is in this painting happens to be in the background area, but it is an area that draws your eye. On the coffee pot, I have two very, very intense colors, one right next to the other. 
there's an additional problem there. The high intensity colors also happen to be complementary colors. High intensity color can be too jarring and too demanding. For example, can you imagine being in a room that is with, painted with nothing but the colors that are on the baseline chart? I doubt it. Not many people can survive in a room like that. The colors are too honking. If you take a look at your, at your paint sample chart again, you will find most of those colors are very low intensities, aren't they? They're not bright. And the ones that are, are the ones that you use for accent colors. Now that should be one of your first clues. The intense colors cover a much smaller area in relationship to the less intense colors. So we've covered the terminology that goes with the word intensity or chroma. Let's go on and cover the last property of color, which is value. Value refers strictly to how light or how dark a color is. How light or how dark a color is. And that's always in relationship to something. Always in relationship to something. If I look at the quilt, I can show you some very, very strong light and dark contrast. The dark blue stands out against the lighter value of the background. Notice that strong light dark contrast draw your eye almost as much as high intensity color draws your eye. Also, value contrast can help make objects recede with the print that is fr uh, matted here. If you look, the values that are in the foreground are very, very close to each other. Therefore, your eye doesn't travel to that area. It goes into the background area. Value control is something that helps us create form. Forms are the basic shape of things. The items that I have over here on this form chart are done with nothing but black and white. I can create dimension if I can control value. So value control is something you really have to learn. Now then, one exercise that you can do that will help you is to take the value scale that's included with your video and practice identifying values. The one that I have here has the numbers with it. Now, do I think it's really important for you to learn what value you're wearing? No, I don't think that's important. I do think it's important that you be able to tell whether or not you have a lot of contrast, how light or how dark something appears to be in relationship to something else. Well, how do I use this? The way I use it is this. I'm going to look for an area that is equal in value. I can see that a value 9 is much lighter than the sweater I'm wearing. As I come down this row, somewhere around a value 4, it's going to be equal, no difference. If I go down to a value 2, it gets much darker and I see contrast again. Granted, not as much contrast, but I do see contrast. So what I'd like for you to do now while the camera freezes on a value scale is I'd like for you to take the time to identify what values you have on your paint sample chart. Now that we're back, I want to cover one more aspect of value. Do I think it's important that you know those numbers? No, it's not. You don't walk into somebody's house and say, bye, you've got a value six cobweb up there in the corner. You just simply don't do it. Is it important that you see value contrast? Yes, it is. I have a print here on the table. It shows very, very strong light, dark contrasts. Notice that your eye is drawn into this area right here. The strong light, dark contrast pulls your eye in. The same thing is true in the matted print. The same thing is true right here. I also have some strong light, dark contrasts. 
value and understanding it is very important. Now then, we have talked about the three separate properties of color, hue, value, and intensity. Do you understand them? Take time to review this section of the tape. Hue refers to the color family. Value refers to how light or how dark a color is. Intensity refers to how bright and vivid a color is or how dull and soft a color is. Pay attention to the vocabulary and learn it well. The next thing we're going to do after I set up my palette is to control value and intensity. Okay, now that we've gone over the basic elements of color, hue, value, and intensity, the next thing that you have to learn is the different ways that you control those properties. There really are only eight ways, so that's simple enough that anybody can learn it. I have a chart up here that's going to show how you can control any color. For this example, I'm going to be controlling the color Naples Yellow. Now, Naples Yellow is not a very bright yellow. It's not a very dark yellow. Notice how I've used those properties. It's still yellow. It's not real bright. It's definitely not a honker. And it's not real dark. Dark refers to value. But I will want to be able to control that color or any color. And these are my choices. Now let's get in the habit of thinking of them as choices because that's really and truly what they are. Now, a choice implies that you have to make a decision. And you have to know where you're trying to get to to be able to make a logical decision. These are choices that you can make to control color intensity and value regardless of where you are in your painting. Let's start with number one. One of the choices that you can make is to choose a color that is within the color family. The color family chart over here shows you a variety of yellows. It could be a light value yellow or a dark value yellow. The yellow that I happen to choose for this example could be like yellow ochre. I can pick that up on a brush and I can look at it and I can say, gee, that's darker in value, so the value is going to get darker automatically. And I could say, it's not as intense. Yellow ochre is nowhere near as intense a color as Naples yellow is, and that's pretty easy to see. Let's see what happens when I apply it to the paint up here. Yes, that's exactly what happens. It darkens Naples yellow, and it also makes it slightly less intense. Now, what would have happened if I had picked up a light value yellow? Something real light, such as the cad yellow medium. Now, I'll do this just in a little tiny area. I can look at that and say it's brighter. Remember that bright refers to intensity. Is it very much lighter? No, not really. It's almost equal in value. So what could I expect to have happen here? You're right. It's going to intensify the color somewhat. It's going to make it closer to the baseline chart yellow, the pure yellow. That's one of my choices. I could choose a color from within the color family to help me control both intensity and value because I would choose a color that is within the family, the color remains the same. Notice how I'm using those three properties, hue, value, and intensity. Another choice that I have is to pick up a neighboring color. Now, if you look at a color wheel, you're going to find that the neighboring colors are what? They're yellow, yellow-orange, yellow-green, okay? On my palette, I happen to have some yellow-orange. Now, the yellow-orange I have here is the baseline yellow-orange, which is a very bright, vivid color. It's also equal in value to Naples yellow. What could I reasonably expect to have happen? Well, I can expect it to make Naples yellow a brighter color brighter, not lighter. They're equal in value. 
And that's what happens. It makes it brighter. What else happens? This time, I'm shifting the color family, aren't I? This is no longer yellow, but it's leaning to the yellow-orange side. The other neighbor that I have on my palette is yellow-green. Now, yellow-green is basically the same value as Naples yellow is, and it is also a very intense color. If I pick up phthalo yellow-green and add it as a neighboring color to control intensity and value, two things happen. The value stays approximately the same, but the color becomes brighter. Actually, three things happen, don't they? It turns to yellow-green. I've again talked about the three properties of a color. The color has changed. It's shifted into the yellow-green or the yellow-orange color family. The value has remained the same. The intensity has increased. It has become brighter and more eye-catching. So using a neighboring color family can be a good choice for you sometimes. But you know, it's kind of like going to the neighbor's house to borrow a cup of sugar. You go over there to borrow the sugar and you go home and you bake the cake. You don't stay at the neighbor's house. When you get through using a neighboring color family, you want to be sure that your object that you're painting still remains within the color family. <coughs> Excuse me. Another choice that I have for controlling intensity and value of a color, and this is an always choice, is I can choose black. Now, those of us who paint know that if I mix black in here, I'm going to get a green. So with the yellow color family, this might not be a super good choice. But if I were working with a red or with a blue, it would be a whole lot better. Let's go ahead and follow through with this. If I add black, black is such a dark value that automatically we know the value is going to get much darker. The intensity of the Naples yellow is lowered dependent upon the quantity of black that I add. What happened to the hue? It's turned a little bit to the green side. Now again, with yellows, that might not be a good choice for me to make, but if I were working with red or blue or green, it might be a very good one. And it is an option that you have. Another choice that you can make is to add white. Now, if I add white, what could I reasonably expect to have happen? Now, I'm asking you to think. Uh, it's really kind of essential, especially if you want to get ahead. If I add white, what happens? Obviously, the white is, is lighter in value than the Naples yellow is. Lighter in value. When I add it to the Naples yellow, that's what happens. Naples yellow gets lighter. My question to you is, does it get brighter? No, it does not. This color is no longer as bright and vivid and clear and pure as the Naples yellow that I have clear up here at the very top. It is a much less intense color. What happened to the color family? Well, it's still a yellow, isn't it? So adding white raises the value, lowers the intensity, and allows the color to stay the same. Now, this may be a very good choice for you, dependent upon where you are in your painting. Another choice that you have is to add the earth color. Now, we haven't really talked about earth colors. And to do that, I think I'd like to refer back briefly to the baseline chart. The baseline chart shows you the different color families. Those color families are yellow, yellow-orange, orange, red-orange, orange, on down the line. Now then, notice when I said the word, the term earth color, I said color. That should be a clue because any color, 
any color that we see can be positioned into a particular color family. For example, on my palette, I have positioned raw umber, which happens to be an earth color, and yellow ochre. I've positioned them as yellows. Raw sienna is a yellow orange. Burnt sienna is a red orange. Burnt umber I use as a red. Now there's another little thing that you need to know. Raw umber oftentimes will lean to the yellow green side. So I've also put a little dab of, yellow, of raw umber here by my yellow green family. I think of these colors as colors. These earth colors are just that to me. They're very dark value, low intensity color for a given color family. If you get in the habit of thinking of them that way, you also get in the habit of thinking of them as a color that you can use to control a color family appropriately. So let's go to the earth color for yellow, the yellow color family, which is raw umber. Now raw umber is a dark value, low intensity yellow. You can see it on the palette. When I add it to this, I can expect these things to happen. Raw umber is going to turn Naples yellow, number one, darker in value. And as I come down, you can see that the Naples yellow is much less intense, not as bright and vivid as it was. So I've lowered the intensity. What have I done with the color? It's still yellow, isn't it? It's just not a real bright, pretty, clear yellow. So adding an earth color is one of the choices that you have for controlling value and intensity. Another choice that you always have is to add the complementary color. Now I gotta tell you that when I finally found out that something would eat dioxazine purple alive, I was one happy camper. Dioxazine purple happens to be the one color that will jump out of this palette and get on my clothes, no doubt about it. So yellow is the only thing that will eat it alive. Why does that work? It works because on the baseline chart, you can see that I've positioned complementary colors opposite of each other. Yellow and violet are complements. Yellow, orange, and blue, violet are complements. Anytime you add two complementary colors together, they lower each other's intensity. How bright and vivid and pure that color is. Remember those words? Another thing about complementary colors while I'm thinking about it, if you look at the teapot and the orange, you're going to see how complementary colors, when they're positioned side by side, are jarring and eye-catching. This is one way that you can draw the viewer's attention. So complements have a lot of uses. Let's go back to the control chart here and add a little bit of this killer color right here. Complementary color of any yellow is violet. Now dioxazine purple is a super strong color. And as I add it and blend a little bit, what you're going to see happen is that the Yellow becomes less intense. What happened to the value? The value got much darker, dependent upon how much purple I put into the mixture. What happened to the color family? It's still yellow, isn't it? Again, I've talked about the three properties of a color. How light or dark a color appears to be, how bright or how dull it appears to be, and what color it appears to be. Those are the three properties that we're trying to control. Now then, you ready for a good time saver? This is one that will save you many, many minutes of mixing color. How many of you have ever looked at a painting that you're working on and you go, gee, that color's just really a little bit too bright? And then you come down to your palette and you think, well, I'll, I'll add some earth color in there. And what you do is you get it too dark. And then you have to figure out a way to get it 
light, and then by that time you've lost the brightness to it. Before long, you're on a roller coaster. You're on an absolute roller coaster. There's a way to avoid that, and this is the way. You add a complementary color that is at the same value. Same value. Now, since dioxazine purple and I do not get along too well, I don't have many purples that I would put out on a palette. So what do I do? I need a complement that is the same value. I'll take a little bit of dioxazine purple, because by itself it could conquer the world, and I will add white until I can mix a value that is equal to Naples yellow. And if we had a value scale up here, I think that we probably would find that those are just about equal. Now, you probably just noticed that I squinted. Anytime I'm checking values, that's one of the things that I do, is I squint my eyes. You know, it's a good excuse for all the crow's feet, but it works. You can literally shut out the color if you will squint your eyes real tight. All right, about equal in value. Now, what did we learn here? We learned that adding a complementary color lowered the intensity. We learned that the color family stayed the same. Now, if I have equal values, what should happen? I should lower the intensity, and the color family should stay the same, and the value should stay the same. This is the time saver. Let's see how close. That's pretty close. Enough practice, I might get this right. All right, purple, equal in value. And what happens? It lowers the intensity. That's all it does, just lowers the intensity. May have gotten that just a touch dark, but I think you get the idea. I can lower the intensity by picking up a complementary color at the same value. Okay. You can see that that color is no longer as vivid, as bright, as pure as what it was. The more of it that I add into the mixture, the less intense that color becomes. Again, it's a relationship. How much purple am I adding in relationship to the Naples yellow that is in there? Definitely lowers the intensity and will save you a lot of time. Another choice that you always have is to add gray. But before we do that, I want you to think about it a little bit. If I add gray, what gray are you thinking of? Is it a light value gray? How about a dark one? How about a medium value? Remember, value is how light or how dark something appears to be. Well, what's going to happen depends upon the relationship of the gray that you use with the value of the Naples yellow. We've already discovered that black is one way to control value. If I add black, it's going to get darker. <clears throat> if I add white, it can get lighter. So let's see what happens if I have a gray that is maybe a little bit darker than the Naples yellow. This is where you're going to need to practice seeing values. And remember, you had the value scale, and that is something that it takes some time to do. Another thing that you could do, and I think I'll take the time to do that right now, is to use a piece of red acetate. Now, the red acetate is something that will block out color, and you really sometimes need to do that. For example, I could take this piece of red acetate and let you look through it at this color family chart. And what happens is it blocks out the color. You see nothing but values. Now, here on my palette, I could take the acetate and do the same thing. And I think I have about equal values, maybe a little bit darker. If I pick up gray and go to this chart, that looks like it may be a little bit darker. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it is. 
All right, we learned with black that if you add black to a yellow, you can expect the value to get darker and possibly to shift the color if you're working with yellows. And that's what's happening. This color is shifting just a little bit into the yellow-green range. What happened to the intensity? It's nowhere near as intense and bright as it was when it was pure color, like this. Okay, those are your eight ways to control intensity and value. And those are really pretty simple, aren't they? And it's something that you can learn. Take the time to memorize these eight choices and be prepared to use them. Now that we've gone through the different ways that you can control intensity and value when you're working with color, I'd like to show you an easy palette layout that should help you. If you'll notice on my palette, I have positioned colors according to the position on the baseline chart. I've gone from yellow to yellow-orange, orange, red-orange, orange, red, red-violet. Under the yellow color family, I have a variety of yellows, including the Naples yellow that I was working with, yellow ochre, and raw umber. Directly beneath that, I've positioned dioxazine purple, which is the complement. Do you see how this could help you? I have the colors within the color family, I have the earth colors, and I have the complement. I also have black and white over here to the side because those are choices no matter what color family you're working with. Each color family, you might have out two or three different colors that are within that family. Underneath them, position your earth color. Beneath that, position the complement if you happen to have it out. I think you'll find this a real logical way to set up a palette and it eliminates having to think too hard about what are my choices for controlling intensity and value. I'm going to set this to one side now and we're going to start talking about color schemes. Color schemes, things that you need to keep in mind before you choose a color scheme. Are you going to put any limits on yourself? If so, what are they? Is realism one of your goals? then if you're going to paint in a realistic style, you need to be choosing colors that will let you do that. If I'm painting something that has a strawberry in it, and I want that strawberry to look like a real one, I probably wouldn't paint it purple. Okay, So that is a limit that you're going to place on yourself. Do I want realism or don't I? If you don't, then the sky's the limit. If you want to, you need to think very, very carefully about those color schemes. What items are in the painting that you intend to do? Other than that, you really have no limits. But once you choose that color scheme, everything needs to appear to relate to that color scheme. So let's go over the basic ones. The first one is monochromatic. Mono meaning one, one color family. For example, it could be yellow or yellow-green or blue, one color family. And because I'm only working with one color family, it becomes dominant. We're going to talk a little bit more about dominance in a minute. Monochromatic color schemes oftentimes will give you the feeling that you're trying to portray a mood. I often have students imagine this in their minds. Shut your eyes for a second. In your mind, visualize this picture. You have some little rolling hills, a weeping willow tree right beside a brook, and it's kind of a misty, cloudy morning. I want you to paint it in greens. What kind of a mood did it convey? Very soft and gentle and peaceful? Take the same objects, the same thing, and let's paint it in red-orange. Totally different, isn't it? What happened is it's now a real hot summer afternoon. You can create a mood using monochromatic color schemes. The next type of color scheme that I want to talk about is called a complementary color scheme. On the baseline chart, remember I showed you how we have yellow and violet, which are directly opposite of each other. Yellow and violet on this color wheel, again, directly opposite of each other. Complementary color schemes. By the way, I'm using something called the Color Star, which is my favorite color wheel. This one eliminates all other colors. I can see what a yellow and violet color scheme looks like against a dark value background. Yellow and violet. 
I can also turn this over and see what that same color scheme appears to be against a light value background. Now if you get a little bit paranoid about color schemes like I do, I had somebody cut out these same wheels for me in a mid-value gray. That lets me see it against a middle value background. Complementary color schemes use two color families, only two. Everything within that color scheme in that painting needs to appear to be within those two limits. <clears throat> one of these two colors has to be dominant, and that is one of your choices. One thing that you're going to have to make a decision on. Another type of color scheme, let's stick with the yellow and violet as the example. Another type of color scheme is called split complementary. Split complementary means that on one side or the other of the complement, yellow and violet, you're going to split. That's real simple to understand, isn't it? This time I've got three color families that I'm working with, yellow, red violet, and blue violet. I could just as easily turn this around and make it violet, yellow orange, and yellow green. Again, I'm working with only three color families and one of those must be the dominant color. Another type of color scheme is called a double split. If you notice that this is getting progressively harder and that rule of keep it simple, you know what, usually applies. A double split complementary scheme is using four color families. Four color families. Again, yellow and violet is the basic color range that I'm working in, but this time I have yellow orange, yellow green, blue violet, and red violet visible. Double split complementary color scheme. Your choice is what color is going to be dominant. I keep talking about dominance, don't I? Have to talk about it a little bit more. Let's go on and think about some of the other color schemes that are possible. Another color scheme is the polychromatic. A polychromatic color scheme is similar to the one that is on this painting that's hanging on the back wall. It uses all 12 color families. All 12 color families. Again, I've had to establish a color dominance. Color dominance. What do I mean by color dominance? Color dominance is the overall color impression that you have of a painting. For example, if we look at the pansy photo album, the pansies are the first thing that you see, but if you had to describe that, that painting to me, you'd say, it's basically yellow. It is. Notice that you saw the violet first. Complementary colors tend to draw the eye. Okay. Color dominance. If we look at the silver bells on the other album, you'll notice that basically that is a green dominant. Green dominant. Even though I have little touches of red in it. Anytime that we are working with complementary colors, one color must be dominant. Anytime you're working any color scheme, one color must be dominant. The last type of color scheme that I would like to go over is called triadic. A triadic color scheme uses three color families that are spaced equal distance apart on the color wheel. Equal distance apart on the color wheel. One of the most basic ones is the one that you probably are most familiar with, red, yellow, and blue. Again, it is up to you to establish which color is going to be dominant. One of the reasons I happen to like the color star is because it shows such a wide variety of color schemes. I've only gone over some of them. There are a lot more. The color star lets you see them. If you have trouble finding this tool, go ahead and write to me and I'll be glad to give you more information. Now then, how do you establish color dominance? Color dominance is established by the total amount of area that is covered. It's also established by how intense that color is. Again, let's look back at the Silver Bells album. Notice that the majority of the area is covered in green and there is very, very little red showing. 
This establishes a cool color dominant. On the Pansy album, which is a warm color dominant, you see the yellow. You also see the violet. Anytime that you're working with a warm color dominant, you need to lower the intensity. Remember, these high intensity colors get to be real, real loud. You do remember loud, don't you? Okay, I figured you would by now. Usually people just dread seeing me pick up that horn. I don't understand why. Um, I'd like to close this video by encouraging you to give yourself credit for what you do know. You know a whole lot more than you think you do. Let me prove it to you real quick. I saw Kate today and she was wearing a blue blouse. Now Kate had this blue blouse on. Let me tell you about it. It was real light and it was kind of dull. Now in your mind's eye, I know what you did. The first thing you did was you thought of blue, just like the blue I have on the baseline chart. The next thing you did was you came over here and you added some white to it. You made it light. And then the next thing you did when I said it was kind of dull, you toned it down. So you know more about color than you think you do. Give yourself credit. And don't expect to learn it all in one day. It did not take me one day or one hour to learn all of this. It does take time. Learning is something that you will be so glad that you did because it gives you the opportunity to look at the world again through a child's eyes. All of a sudden, it's exciting to go out and look and see color. I mean, really see it. How light is that green or how dark is it? How bright is it or how dull is it in relationship to something? Now, the second video that I'll be doing will cover creating center of interest, positioning color, line of design, and a lot of other things that are going to affect how you use color. I'll look forward to working with you then. Thanks. Barb Watson is the author and publisher of 11 books, and she teaches seminars internationally, specializing in teaching color theory in her down-to-earth, easy-to-understand style. Her latest book, The ABCs of Color, Keeping It Simple, is a must-have item for all color theory students. For information on sponsoring a seminar or for a current list of books and artists' aids, please write to Barb Watson. Post Office Box 9311, Ontario, California, 91762.